Okay, great. Um, and then you want to add a perspective uh, since you are a part, a key part of that ecosystem, the yeah. Fab ecosystem. So, a couple of things. I think uh, number one, yes, does an ecosystem uh, exist? I would say yes, it does, but not in the scale of what we're talking about. Okay. Uh, today, if we look at uh, just applied materials with 2,300 employees in India with 10 years, uh, we're, we have a lot of our employees have worked in fabs across the world. Uh, we, we work with IIT Bombay, IASC on, we have a 200 millimeter fabrication area. The scale is the question, mm -hmm. I think. So clearly that has to uh, uh, step up. And, and I think, again, it goes back to this point at chicken, egg. The key thing is today, once the fab comes, the rest of the players of the ecosystem that are removed will be pulled in based on, as Dr. Madhuri said, business viability, right, of it, that then will sustain this in areas of necessary leadership so that you can have a global fab that is not purely centered around cost-driven uh, activities. Got it. Wonderful. So uh, you, when we talk about ecosystem, one of the related topics always is uh, talent, manpower, right? And Dr. Maduri, you talked about the fact that a lot of uh, folks globally who are in this business have reached out to you and expressed an interest to come back. And I'm sure that'll help seed the team and you know, get things off the ground. But again, from, a, uh, from, from getting to the scale, from getting to sustainability, we will need to have some uh, effort to develop fab relevant talent in India as well. Uh, so Professor Vasi, again, I'd like to start with you on that question. Um, what do you, how do you see that playing out? And then Ian, I'd like to get your perspective because you've seen similar journeys being embarked upon in other parts of the world. How's, what's worked there and what might work for us here in India? So. so so on the manpower, the talent part of it, I think really we are in a pretty good position. That's, I would say, not going to be a very major worry. Firstly, there is a huge diaspora of people, you know, outstanding people, mainly in the US, but in other parts of the world as well. And as Dr. Meduri pointed out, many of them want to come back. So that's something we need to obviously capitalize on. Even if we look within India, I think the government, DATI, has done an excellent job in creating centers of excellence. Started off at IIT Bombay and IIC, but now has reached out to several other places where people are being trained. And we're talking about people both at the researcher level as well as at the engineer level. Mm -hmm. So I would say there is enough talent out there initially. Of course, we may want to build up some certain pockets of it. If I really look at also the technician part, that's something we will have to address, the skills development and so on. But even that's something which some of us have been looking at. For example, IIT Bombay together with Applied Materials has been running uh, programs, courses for really focusing on technicians. So okay. that's been happening and we need it, of course, we need it to grow. And the last thing I would mention on the talent aspect is that, again, there's really I w what I would call a very successful program running in India, and that's the Indian Nano Electronics Users Program. And there have been literally hundreds of researchers and students from all over, from colleges, universities all over the country who have come and used the facilities at IIT Bombay, at IISC, and now it's going to be some of the other IITs also coming in, where the facilities exist, but people from all over the country are coming and using it. So I think there is already a reasonably widespread availability of talent. So, Great. So other than, other than uh, focus on perhaps developing the technician level talent, do you feel that the rest of it is, 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 is fairly well covered at this point in I time? I would say that it, I mean, it is fairly well covered and not, to, not something to worry too not much Not to worry about. about. Okay. Ian? Sure. Uh, thank you. And I would suggest that uh, workforce is really an area where the government can be most helpful alongside two other fundamental pillars, and that's building the research infrastructure and ensuring a uh, an investment in regulatory climate that will permit success. 
On the workforce front, uh, you know, luckily no one is starting from scratch. There are plenty of examples all over the world in which we are building a, a workforce capable of meeting some of the, the 21st century challenges in the semiconductor industry. I, I mentioned uh, you know, several programs. Uh, the Semiconductor Research Corporation, which was formed in 1982 in the United States, uh, perhaps is one good example mm -hmm. in which we've really leveraged uh, universities uh, all over the world, uh, including uh, you know, the US, uh, uh, the Nano Electronics Research Initiative, which includes over 30 universities, is really focused on you know, finding the, the next switch uh, you know, beyond 2020. But what it really is doing is building a workforce that's capable of designing and manufacturing that next switch. So I think those wor workforce and research challenges are, are so connected. And this is an area where government can play a fundamental role. It doesn't come natural to these universities or schools to talk to one another. Uh, and that's what these programs have forced them to do. Uh, so we're not, you know, uh, uh, having a lot of duplicative research or people, uh, you know, not connecting to industry. What it's really doing is having the government, academia, and industry all in the same room and talking about, you know, what unique um, challenge are we going to, to put our, our money towards. Uh, so that, that's one uh, great example uh, of, uh, you know, how to build the workforce over the long term. And I think, uh, you know, you're well on your way here in India, uh, as, uh, as you mentioned. Wonderful, wonderful. Sure. Yeah. So I think one of the things, as, as Professor Vasi and Ian pointed out, is uh, the infrastructure piece that comes along with this, right? I think uh, the need is articulated by the fact, yes, there's, is there going to be one fab, two fabs, many fabs? Uh, but what we have done is we have published a white paper to DIT, uh, DIT and um, it basically lays out uh, what we think is a path that just Ian articulated of a, of a government-enabled private-public partnership that has phases of approach, where the first phase of it is around setting up training mm -hmm. on a larger scale. Again, it's the scale that's the key part here, followed by subsequent phases of a research and development center that has open innovation that calls all aspects of the ecosystem to be pulled together. So really, it has been, this, this model has worked in many countries. Mm -hmm. I think the examples are, are very clear. And we can reproduce the model very easily here, but it does involve the government industry and academia coming together and that's something that we've also been working closely with IIT Bombay in trying to uh, ensure that is done parallelly with the setting up of the FAP. Okay. Wonderful. Yes, Dr. Rob. A short point from experience. Uh, while the points made by Professor Vashi and Ian uh, are well taken, government has taken initiatives, the centers of excellence, we have to be making those efforts. I want to make one point that, you know, the demand has its own way of creating availability. Mm -hmm. uh, I do remember way back in 1981 when we started to establish SCL and I'm, I'm sure where were the engineers who had even seen a silicon vapor, let alone work with them, where were the technicians, but all we did is we went to not only IITs, but uh, you know, Bengal Engineering College and IIT, BHU and all other colleges picked up the, the very bright uh, engineers. Likewise, the technicians also very bright uh, plus two uh, uh, level uh, uh, people. And by and large, we did two things. One is some well-structured training within the plant, within our company. And most importantly, we challenged it. And I think that that is something that I would like to emphasize. So we just get the people. You know, once you that, you will find people. You just if there's enough bright people, you just have to get them. You have to train them appropriately, but more importantly, challenge them, and you will have them there. Now this is eight, 81 time frame. Today, of course, situation is much better. As he said, you know, Dr. Maduri also said, there are people willing to relocate themselves. So, you know, those days you had only expatriate nationals coming under that famous doctrine program to 
come and only offer help. But today people are prepared to relocate themselves and not right. offer help but do things by themselves. So we're in a happier situation and I don't, but the reason I interjected is that I, I'm not worried. I, I do think that this is not something that will become an impediment. That's why I wanted to interject. Yes, especially I, since the JP group is also in the business of education. No, no, but I think we should add that we, in, in, our, in our contract, we have a very comprehensive and very substantial training program involving a lot number of engineers spending as much as six months to a year on site. On site. That's okay. why. We, we got it built in and uh, I'm sure that that will deliver it. Wonderful, wonderful. So let's roll forward now a little bit, right? I mean, a fab is off the ground and it's operational and it's functional. Um, if, you, if, you, if you look into the future, what opportunities do you see this creates for the broader ESDM ecosystem and more specifically, from a point of view of innovation and entrepreneurship, right? what opportunities does it create and what else do you believe needs to be done to help realize the possibilities and opportunities in that uh, context? So again, Professor Vasi, I'd like to start with you on that question. In fact, it is a great opportunity for entrepreneurship as we go along. You know, we've already talked, I've, I've mentioned briefly some of the areas where entrepreneurship will flourish. Also, even from the design company's perspective, you know, we have right here in Bangalore, many of the design companies. But what I hope this will do is actually create a lot of uh, design specific to India and a lot of IP being generated by Indian companies. So that's an, you know, another area of entrepreneurship, hopefully, which will flourish, especially if the Electronic Development Fund of the government EDF, uh, yeah. go, EDF goes through. The other thing I would say is that there is probably a lot of scope also for innovation in many other ways. And one of the things I would mention is that uh, uh, you know, even as the two foundries, uh, two, uh, in fact, one should not call them foundries, as the two fabs come up, it's what we should also have are some IMAC-like institutions which would be doing uh, research, which would be interacting with the community outside. And the reason, of course, is that as we move forward, the, I'm sure the fabs would like to actually use a lot of these uh, activities going on in a co-located co uh, institution like IMEC uh, based in India. Again, that would really require, as Aninda pointed out, industry, government, and academia all to come together. Partnership, and this right. is a great opportunity for this to happen, which itself would lead to innovation in many ways. Wonderful.